So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Adil. I'll be uh, one of your moderators for the session today. Again, welcome all the participants and the interest uh, in our CMBS webinar series. A couple of sort of standard announcements before we start. Uh, once again, I'd like to put a plug to our CMBS conference 2024 happening May 28th to the 30th in Toronto. Uh, again, wanted to highlight and emphasize some of the great opportunities you have to engage with our biomed community. We have a couple of exciting uh, sessions planned in that conference. There's the CISO day that includes the troubleshooting challenge. Uh, we have right to repair sessions or a right to repair afternoon rather, uh, where we have a great uh, session planned with and we're gonna have some breakout sessions and get some updates on the right to repair movement that's happening across North America uh, and the world. Uh, we'll have vendor exhibits, uh, continuing education, we have peer review sessions, so we have a good amount of things. Uh, so I would definitely encourage everybody to register. Registration is now open uh, uh, and go to cmbs.ca to register and see conference details. Um, I would also like to thank sort of our presenters and our, uh, our expert presenter today. Um, we appreciate you coming and taking your time out of your busy schedule to uh, help us uh, and talk about women in engineering, which is the focus of these, this webinar series and this month, uh, how women impact the engineering profession in a traditionally male-dominated profession, how women are taking the reins and really going to leadership levels uh, and adding value to the profession uh, today. So we'll be hearing from uh, Ala. And before we, I hand it off to Michael to introduce her, uh, just a quick couple of notes. Please, please, please utilize the chat. Uh, sorry, do not utilize the chat functionality. Utilize the QA functionality for any questions you may have. That's what we're using uh, to make sure that all your questions are commented, answered, uh, and documented as well. Um, and as and as 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 from other webinars, we are going to be asking for uh, questions to be. You can ask questions throughout the webinar, but we'll be answering them uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michael. Thanks, Adele. Um, I'm doing my best Marianne uh, Javier impression right now because normally she would be doing the introduction. <clears throat> However, everyone in our profession will appreciate this. She's experiencing March Madness, so she's uh, very much uh, occupied with a last minute uh, um, ship, large shipment, etc. Typical March Madness stuff uh, with capital equipment. Um, Thrilled to have uh, Allah Hussein with us today um, to talk about. Um, there are ma so many different aspects of talking about a wonderful, much more diverse um, group of engineers, engineering colleagues around the table. Thrilled to hear her perspectives today. Um, so let me just do a quick little intro. So uh, Allah is a professional engineer with uh, PMP, Professional Management um, a professional designation uh, and has over a decade of leadership uh, experience in engineering, construction, and operations. Um, she has successfully executed multi million dollar projects within the natural gas, renewable energy, and battery recycling energy uh, industries. Um, she's from a civil engineering background um, from U of T and embarked on a journey in project management with a, a real specialty in construction management and project execution strategies. Uh, so she currently works as a senior manager at Lifecycle Corp, where she is leading the build of the first hydrometallurgical facility in North America, and also, um, which is also the first of its kind for that company. So we uh, very much welcome you to our space, uh, Ala. And um, actually, I'm remiss because I didn't kick things off. I'm coming to you from uh, Kibuktuk in um, lovely Halifax, traditional uh, um, uh, lands of the Mi'kmaq, and um, we we like to kind of introduce where we are since we are right across the country. Um, but I uh, just wanted to make sure um, we acknowledge that um, where we're all from, and how much like we're talking about today, we are all a very rich, wonderful group. Uh, I like to think of us as a Canadian family around the table. So let's hear a story. Um, as for our friend and colleague, Ala. Ala, floor is yours. So we usually go 45 minutes and about 15 minutes-ish for questions at the end. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you to the CMBS uh, for having me today. Uh, it's exciting. I am not a biomed engineer, as Michael alluded. Uh, I'm a civil engineer by background, but I'm hoping that a lot of the things that I do touch on as part of my presentation, they resonate with the female engineers that are at the table, as well as others as well. So I'm hoping that the messaging is more universal um, and I'm able to equip everyone with the tools of what the female engineers as well as others can do um, to make it a more inclusive environment. So where do I begin? Breaking boundaries and triumphing as a female engineer at work and at home. A little bit of an introduction, just to add a little bit more to what Michael was saying and to highlight some of the key things that were in, in that description there. So uh, I'm a Pakistani Muslim. Uh, I was not born in Canada. So we immigrated and I became a Canadian when I was actually 11 years old. The other thing as well is that over in my over a decade of experience, I have been um, in civil engineering. Obviously that's what I studied, um, but I focused my efforts out of those 13 years, 11 years of them have been in construction management, um, project management as a whole, but very much having that on-site presence as a leader um, of the site itself, the contractors, the consultants, everyone that's at the table. Um, civil engineering, some, some statistics that I wanted to share with the group here. I know that we all understand that engineering as a whole is very male dominated. Some disciplines uh, are more, more male dominated than others. Um, and I would say that includes civil engineering. So based on some stats, you're looking at about 15% female. Uh, when it comes to uh, that professional realm. And in construction, it's, a, it's an overall 13%, which includes trades. So there's a big push for having female presence in the trades as well. So when it comes to leadership, it's actually an even smaller percentage that, to be honest, I couldn't find a number to. So you can only understand and, and, and envision the fact of how minimal it is to have on-site management um, and having a woman present there. Another thing too, as you see a photograph of my family, this is my support system. So I've got two boys with my husband and uh, I also have my first child, which is a cat named Sibby. Uh, we didn't have a family picture with her that I could share, but um, they're, these, these folks are key to me in embracing my work life balance, which I would like to delve into. So my story, when I was trying to frame what this presentation is going to be about, how I can highlight key things. I felt that there's four key stages that I'd like to go through with the group here about, which basically evolves, involves my story. Um, and those four stages would be kind of my early years, my career start, COVID, as well as the now, what is, what is the present. And in doing that, I wanna highlight over obviously my career journey as a whole, but the challenges that I've come across and some of the key learnings that I've not, not only had in that time period, but also things that I've just carried through to with me um, throughout my career. And I continue to practice them today as well. So early years, as I mentioned, Pakistani Muslim, but I was actually born in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, there were three girls uh, to, uh, to two wonderful parents. Um, and as you may realize, Saudi Arabia in the 1980s and 1990s, although they're becoming very progressive now, at that time, there weren't many opportunities for girls. Um, and that wasn't only from a career standpoint, it went down to education as well. So my parents took the leap in their mid 40s and they decided to immigrate to Canada. I was eight years old at the time to be able to provide us with the right opportunities um, and the right education, the education that we deserve. Um, because my parents, for them, it was about the fact that there's no limit to what a girl can do. Absolutely not. They were also both very career oriented. My mother owned a hair salon of her own, actually in Saudi Arabia as well. So you can only imagine the kind of barriers and challenges she came across. And my father was also a mechanical engineer. And for them, there was no limits absolutely to what was achievable. So what I ended up doing, I was always very intrigued by buildings, you know, the artistic aspects of it, just the beauty, the history, where do buildings stem from? They really um, kind of morph into different cultures as well, and they represent different times um, in society. All to say that my end goal was was actually to pursue, my, uh, um, to become an architect. Um, so what I decided is that to pursue civil engineering in my bachelor's as an undergrad, 
to be able to truly understand how buildings are designed, what is it that it takes to actually build them from the ground up? I thought that it would set up a good foundation, no pun intended there, but um, it would set up a great foundation for understanding the artistic side of it and, and kind of diving into the design piece of it. So my journey started, I said, I'm gonna pursue civil engineering, undergrad, boom, I'm gonna go into my master's in architecture and before you know it, that's it, done deal. I know exactly what my career path is. Took a bit of a turn when I was doing my bachelor's degree because there started to be a lot of emphasis on renewable energies and sustainability um, and the kind of um, the kind of um, impact that you can have in that type of an industry and realm. So architecture went out the window. I pursued civil engineering and I graduated um, from the University of Toronto. At that point, I started my career in an oil and gas company. And you're probably going to think oil and gas is definitely not sustainable or anything to do with sustainability. But the reality is at that point, there was a lot of initiatives starting with renewable energies. It was it was up and coming. Um, and there I had a real interest in, in pursuing something like that. So I ended up going into oil and gas, telling myself every morning when I woke up in front of the mirror that, listen, it's fossil fuels for now, but I will get to solar, I will get to wind, I will get to everything else that's clean. I eventually ended up in their major projects group and this was my first exposure to the multi-million dollar complex projects. Um, and when I went into the major projects group, it wasn't as simple as sit at your desk and design, design essentially what's going to be installed, but you, you're involved with the technical aspects of it, the permitting, the procurement, the contracts, and then out the door you go actually on site managing the contractors and the folks that are out there. So young me, I'm a female engineer. Um, I had obviously my first exposure on site uh, when it comes to construction management and everything of that, that sort. There were obviously experiences, very uncomfortable experiences that I'm, I came across as part of that. One of them, for example, flirting. And this is, you know, it's one thing to be subtle about it. It's another where you're trying to have a conversation with a contractor and all he keeps doing is complimenting you, your body image, your physical appearance, whatever the case may be, even coming to as close as trying to just touch your arm or whatever the case may be. There were also whistles. So people that are whistling at you while you're walking by or whatever the case may be. The other thing I came across was discrimination from a standpoint of a contractor that may not be familiar with the site coming um, into my office and asking me who's in charge. I need to get paper sign off for X drop off. And I would say, I'm in charge. I can sign it for you. And he would uh, keep asking me the same question. Like it, it just wasn't registering for him that what do you what do you mean a woman can be in charge of this site? And they would try to divert the situation, the ones if you'd call it that were more respectful. So they would say, mm, can I speak to a supervisor instead? Do you have a foreman around? Which are different um, different roles on site, obviously, but ones that are definitely male. Um, and then there was the other thing too, is I was definitely lucky enough to not get go through the obvious discrimination. So there may be workers. I've had um, colleagues of mine that have said, you know, the obvious discrimination where a worker just downright said that they're not gonna listen to what she has to say or she, there is no way in hell that he's gonna work for her, as an example. Thankfully, I was very lucky in that sense, but I think the way that society is evolving, and I'll, I'll dive into that more, is that there's a lot of subtle discrimination. There's a, a lot of awareness on what's the obvious, but the subtle discrimination is what's more long-term, and I feel what's more painful for female engineers as a whole. I was also lucky enough to not get the obvious discrimination because, I think generally on site and being as a female engineer, what your management team, your people leader, and even at your level, the kind of friendships and relationships that you establish with your counterparts go a long way. So if for instance, my counterpart on, part on the contractor side um, gains respect for me, we have a friendship, we have that trust instilled, it's going to trickle down to the people that directly report to him as well. And that goes a long way in establishing that respect on site. Out of that, some of my learnings were site dynamics. So it's not to say that it's the right way. I don't think, I think it's going to take us a long way to get to a different format. But the reality is that on site, um, there's a, a chain of command, there's a hierarchy. Um, and it's just the way to get work efficiencies 
Um, the folks that are actually doing the work on site, it's the only way that they are efficient, that where they understand who to go to when there's an issue, there's that point of contact and go from there. So in understanding that chain command and establishing the right relationships on site to be able to gain that trust and that respect had went a long way for me. So it wasn't a matter of me going and saying, I am well above this chain of command because I am the owner, for instance, or I'm representing the owner. But it was rather, okay, the contractor, the construction manager, or my counterpart is X. This is the person that I'm going to be very collaborative and communicative with. with. The rest of them, obviously, as issues arise, whatever the case may be, uh, we'll deal with it. Um, and that led to the versatile management piece of it. So there was the collaborative approach with some, and then there was the authoritative when it came to the workers and folks on site. You just had to be, I had to be a lot more cutthroat which was difficult for me because I am I'm more on the empathetic side when it comes to managing people. The other thing was having a seat at the table. So as female engineers, in a lot of cases, especially coming from such a male dominated realm, you have to test, you get tested when it comes to your competency, when it comes to your knowledge, when it comes to your expertise. And in being able to talk the talk and walk the walk, you have to be able to ask the right questions, question the questions, um, and answer the questions as well. Once that's, that was some of the key things that I found and in formulating that formula for myself, it was also about finding comfort in the discomfort and the intimidation. And by discomfort, I mean no way that you become, you brush off the, um, you know, the, the kind of discrimination that you go through on site. That was, all of that was unacceptable. And in the moment it was definitely dealt with. But it's rather trying to find the comfort in, in the uncomfortable situations where you have to prove yourself a little bit more than others may. Um, where you are the one person, the one woman that's in a meeting of, let's say, 10 to 15 males. And being able to have that presence at the table and being able to have the influence that you should have as being a leader um, and creating that impact. Um, so it was an intimidation that you... I had to embrace to be able to overcome um, a lot of the challenges that I initially had. On to COVID. So I have my first child at this point. He's a three-year-old toddler. Um, I had also transitioned over to a battery recycling company. So what I was helping this company do is that they had done a lot of R&D, research and development, and they needed someone to help them commercialize and scale up. So a lot of challenges. We all had a lot of physical, mental, and emotional challenges during COVID. And I wanted to touch on some of mine um, during that experience as well, is obviously we were working virtually. So managing the projects, the projects were still a go. This was a private company that had invested a lot of money into different plants that were paused because of COVID. So the intention was let's get construction going. Let's move these projects as fast as we can on a tight budget, regardless of the pandemic or not. The other thing as well is that these plants were being built in the U.S. And the U.S. has a very different environment. I would say that the discrimination there is a lot more prevalent than it is in Canada. We're definitely ahead of them when it comes to the open mindedness. But with them, again, going back to that subtle discrimination, which is always lingering, is very obvious there. So either way, dealing with a pandemic, dealing with my toddler who would be screaming, who had his needs, and the reality is my child needed me 24 seven at that stage, right? Um, there's no social interaction. There is no schooling at that point. I am his everything. Um, and so to be able to manage that, having calls with him in the background, having him on video and jokingly, he became the junior employee, but being able to accept the fact that yes, I have a family, other people have families or loved ones. Um, you know, we all have lives and we all have things that go beyond our careers. Um, was a big learning for me. And that's something that I've tried to carry with me even after COVID. The other thing was also nurturing my family, my home and work and trying to find that balancing act, especially during COVID. I'll be honest with you, it was very much, you know, I would sleep probably, you know, in, in different increments. It wasn't a matter of having much of a routine. And I know that we were all there in order to accommodate all the needs that I had at that point. So You've got the nine to five job where you're working away, trying to get a project out the door, working with the, the designer, working with the contractors, whatever the case may be, your child needs you in between, needs you in the evening as well. And then, you know, I would sleep for a little bit and then I'd be up again, um, trying to hash out a few other emails, whatever the case may be before again, I would start my work day and my meetings again. 
Some of the learnings from that, as I mentioned, everyone has a family, whether it's chosen or natural. We all have a story. We all have those that bring a twinkle in our eyes and, and being able to bring that story out of people is what truly helps you gain that, again, trust and respect um, as, a, as a female engineer and a, and a leader in an industry that's so male dominated. The other thing I think that, um, and it's this is in no way to discriminate against males, but I feel that females uh, tend to have a more, it's empathy and vulnerability come more naturally to, to females. And I feel that for, for a long time, we haven't thought of it being as a powerful tool. Whereas I feel through my experience that it has been probably one of the most powerful things that I've experienced. And it can be as simple as trying to put yourself in other people's shoes, truly trying to understand what their challenges are. Everyone has good days and bad days. And it doesn't mean that it's work related, but it's rather other frustrations and other things that may be brewing in the background. And if you're able to tap into that with someone, your relationship and the personalities that come out, they go a long way in you being able to accomplish what you want. The technical competence will always be there. As an engineer, you will be competent, you will have the knowledge, and you'll have all those technical capabilities. But it's rather now tapping into the soft skills and truly understanding um, what others are capable of, what's on their mind, and truly what's their story. And that was something that I, I really learned and embraced during COVID. The other thing that alludes to the fact that personal can be professional. It's not to say that we have to separate the two. If they go hand in hand, you all the more become more powerful as a person and as a as an employee. Over to post COVID. So I was on maternity leave. Uh, I came back uh, in 2021 and I was um, put on to the hydrometallurgical facility build. So as during post COVID and this happened with my first per, uh, with my first child as well is there was a lot of interaction during that maternity leave with the company. They're, they're great, their culture is great, there's no doubt about it. And for them, they were private, they were, they were a group of 30 people when I left. And in between, in that one year, they went public, they, they ramped up to about 150 people, if not more. Um, and they were trying to place all the resources in the right spots and essentially you know, mapping out exactly what the long-term plan looks like for the company. And as part of that, I definitely no doubt had interactions with my people leader. He was absolutely great. But the one thing that occurred is when I returned from my maternity leave, um, I was taken a few steps back professionally. Um, and I had to work my way up in the first year to basically get back to the same level, if not a little bit more. Whereas if there was consideration, proper consideration, um, corporate wide, you could say, because it was a smaller company, but if there was proper consideration and resource allocation done, I feel that it may have been a bit of a different story. So that goes to my point here with experiences as a female of being the forgotten. Um, we, there's, there's a lot of, there's a huge push now, especially in the Canadian realm to, to allow for males also to take parental leave. So this may be something that can be set as an example for them too, but obviously females are ones that still are, are dominating the maternity or parental leave realm. And in, in that one year, it's important for companies to realize that um, you haven't lost your knowledge, you haven't lost your skills. If anything, they've been enhanced with a newborn baby. Um, and it's important to place and keep that person in consideration because 90% of the time they are bound to return to you as an employee. Um, you have the 10% that's risky and that's more so on the culture, but there's definitely an importance for consistency when it comes to maternity leaves or any long leaves. So it's important to, to keep them in mind when you're looking at succession planning and you're looking at their abilities of what to do next, what is next for them. The other thing was that this project, um, it's being built in Rochester, New York. So it took a lot of travel time. Um, there was a lot of overnights. There's a, there was a lot of needs for those. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without my support system, to be honest. The patients that I had from my children, um, the support that I had from my husband, there were days where I would sit back and say, you know what, I'm done with this. This is exhausting for you. It's exhausting for me. And he was the one who was like, no, you have to do this. Like you're, you're building a hydrometallurgical facility and you're the only woman on site. Like you can't, you, you cannot do this. So having that kind of support system is so key um, to be able to really pursue what you want, especially as a female engineer. The other thing that I came across when it came to some of the discrimination was in my travels, a lot of the folks, and they were males, again, subtle. It's going back to the subtlety of it all, is the 
number one question that they had for me is who's with the kids? Um, what, what, are, what happened to the kids? Are they, you know, what, where are they? Um, who's managing them? And initially I was justifying it to say my husband, of course, my husband, this and that. And I just came to a point where I was like, you know, there, there comes a point where there's more to me than my kids and my family and they need to understand that as well. So just as subtle as they were with me, I was subtle back. Um, the questions that came out to me, I just asked them back and I said, who's with your kids? Just astonished, right? I knew it was their wives or spouses or partners more than likely. But that kind of set the stage for them to truly understand the fact that, okay, no, that isn't appropriate. And, you know, she is more than that. There's obviously um, more to the story. There's another partner that's in the picture. Or I would just jokingly say, you know, I'm happily married and there are two of us for a reason. Um, so if I'm not there, it obviously has to be my husband or someone else who can compensate for while he's not there. But that, that question on its own and the subtlety of it also told me that, you know, is a male to male going to ask the same question? Absolutely not. Um, so it, it's important for us to realize that differentiation as well as we ask for these things. And it was genuine out of them. It's not to say that they said it out of spite or anything like that, but it's it's there are things that are just subconsciously programmed as well that I think we need to start becoming conscious about. When it comes to diversity and inclusion, so this one was a first for me. And I think this was one that was probably one I think over time, I came across a lot of situations, um, subtle ones again, but this was one that has really stuck out to me as probably the number one um, in, my, in my experience. And this was basically a panel um, in Rochester, New York that we had hosted for our general contractor as well as um, unionized workers, um, unionized organizations, et cetera, just to be able to lure folks in for construction of the project. On the panel, I think there were eight to 10 people. Uh, I was the only woman and I was also racially the only minority. Um, and so panel went great. There was a lot of questions about diversity, equity and inclusion. They were well managed, et cetera. And then we just had a, a recap with an intimate group afterwards where we had some of our external consultants and stakeholders sit at the table as well. And in that whole process, the one external stakeholder, he looks at me and he said, oh boy, you saved us in this panel. And I'm thinking to myself, save them. I barely said anything. But so I probed for it a little bit more to understand what do you, what do you mean by saving? He's like, well, all these DNI questions. I mean, if we didn't have you, we wouldn't have checked all any of those boxes or all of those boxes off. And for me, it was the first time that the discrimination was not only because of me just being female, it was because of me being different, looking different than everyone else. And again, it goes back to the fact that his intention by no means was to be rude, attacking in any way, but it's that experience of being isolated. It's that experience of looking different and being different from others that keeps on appearing as a theme, right? And at that stage, no one said anything. Um, and from my perspective as well, it was so uncomfortable that I made a joke of it. And I said, yeah, I should definitely get extra brownie points from it just because of, you know, just my presence. And from that perspective, that night, uh, my, my people leader was there as well. And he gave me a call and he actually apologized. And he said that was completely out of control. And I am so sorry that I myself did not say anything to be able to revert the situation or to be able to manage the situation. As your people leader, I should have supported you and I should have been there to defend you. But he said, to be honest, this was my very first situation that was so discriminatory. And I, I just, I didn't know how to manage it. And just that acknowledgement on its own went a long way. But would I have done it any differently? I most definitely would have. And I think we as women, we as female engineers don't give us or give ourselves that opportunity to show that confidence and to be able to provide that response. And in some cases, it's just because it's shock mode. Like this was a shock mode for me. It was not something I had dealt with before. I had dealt with the other, the other things over and over again. So from that perspective, it wasn't an issue. I had a response ready. But when there's something that's also racial or ethnic related, this was my very first time. And, you know, it, it, it was an opportunity for me to, to um, process some of this. The fact that, again, we do have subtle discrimination and that goes subconscious, not just being as obvious. 
But those are things that we have to work on ourselves ourselves as well to be able to respond to, but also the support system that surrounds us. So it's not just a support system at home, but we need to have that support system at work as well. The other thing is that there's the next generation that's coming in, into, into play. I don't want to age myself here, but we have a lot of young engineers now, um, female engineers that are entering into the market. Um, they have been ongoing uh, and entering into it. And as female engineers that are already in this um, industry or in who have the experience and who have dealt with a lot of situations, we need to be able to support these female engineers instead of just assuming, oh, I went through it. So this person's just going to have to deal with it themselves as well. We need to break that cycle and we need to be able to support to help that person thrive and make sure that they don't go through what we did because it's, that it's, it's unacceptable in the grand scheme of things, right? An example of that is that there was a female engineer on my team, a young electrical engineer, first time being on site. And the, the feedback that she constantly received was you just you got to you got to throw you got to grow thick skin um, because it's just that's just how it is on site for women. You just you have to go through grow thick skin. And for me, the feedback, this wasn't feedback from me. Feedback for me was, listen, yes, you need to have thick skin, but it's for, you know, there may be inappropriate jokes on site. Uh, there may be, um, you know, uh, scenarios where you have to work long hours, but it shouldn't be a situation where you feel uncomfortable. And if that's the case, you have to come to me. There was a situation where a contractor flirted with her to an extent where she was very uncomfortable. She was trying to have technical conversations with him. He's coming back to her and saying similar situations to what I had been through early on in my career. She came to me with it, consulted me on it. And she said, and I was like, okay, well, what's your solution? What do you, what should we do about it? And she said, okay, I'm just not going to have one-on-ones with him. I'm going to make sure that there's someone else participating in that meeting. And my question back to her was, why do you need to accommodate the situation? Why is it that you feel that this is acceptable in any way? And for her, the discomfort also was of, is this going to be career limiting for me? Is it going to cause, is it going to be a, a bigger issue than it really is? Although I think it is a very big issue. Um, am I going to cause issues with the contractor? Like these are all the things where she's trying to accommodate others instead of thinking for herself. And I told her, look, I, I will speak to our director, our VP about this situation. You will not be a part of it other than your name. But the reality is that this person should not be accepted on site anymore. And if our employers don't support that, then we should not be working for them, period. And with that, she was comfortable. The contractor was someone that was let go, whatever the case may be, long story short. But ultimately, we have to be able to support, going back to what I was saying, is break that cycle and not be able to be that confidant for another fellow female engineer um, and be able to provide them with the perspective. Because in a lot of cases, um, I feel that we as female engineers make a lot of exceptions. Um, and I think we need to stop doing that and really looking out for ourselves when it comes to these scenarios. My learnings vouch for yourself. Um, so that was when it came down to the forgotten. And I gave feedback to the company um, uh, as we were working through some of these pains of the maternity leave, me not really getting the opportunity that I was envisioning for myself. And it wasn't, it wasn't in a way uh, out of spite or anything, but it was constructive feedback for the people leader um, to be able to say, listen, you know, same as what I just said before, is that just because I'm on mat leave doesn't mean that my skills, uh, my competencies, my potential changes in any way. Um, and we have to be able to remember those that are on leaves, period. And if they're the op they have the opportunity to support the company in being successful, then we should definitely slot them in. And if it's just a matter of waiting for them for X number of months to return, then so be it. Have an interim person instead, for instance. Boundaries. So... Going back to the project and the amount of travel that I had to do, I always voiced and I continue to voice the fact that my family is my everything. And we have that kind of sentiment across our team. And when it came to traveling to Rochester, you know, it came to a point where it had to be on a weekly basis. And I had to negotiate with them to say, listen, I will do whatever I need to do virtually, but you can only have me for two days a week at most. Three days is the exception once in a while, but I cannot do more than two days. And I get to decide when that occurs because my family is my priority. 
And something like that should not be a career limiting thing as well. I feel like a lot of that load comes on females generally when it comes to, again, that home life um, and being able to have, be a balancing act for, for the kids. Um, and that's where as employers and as, as colleagues, we need to be able to set those boundaries and have that understanding for them. Again, supporting other women and setting up your support system, not only personally, but even in the, in, in the work, work front. So a summary of my learnings, not only for the fellow females, but also their colleagues and for everyone in general. Um, so to start off for the fellow females, be your unapologetic self, discover and embrace your confidence. I feel in a lot of times I come across very intelligent and very capable engineering uh, engineers that are female and they're constantly questioning themselves of, Am I capable of doing this? Am I capable of doing that? Oh, if I do this, it's going to compromise on my family. Whatever the case may be, it's important for us to embrace the confidence. You know, you're an engineer. You have studied very hard to get to where you are. You've licensing, whatever the case may be, the designations that you have, they speak for themselves. And there should be by no means you questioning your capabilities. Being your unapologetic self as well. And now I'm not saying that you start becoming con condescending or spiteful or witty um although witty can be great if you're if you're a funny one but an apologetic self is something where you need to stop catering to others especially if they put you in uncomfortable situations and and say it like it is and this is something these are all things mind you that i'm con constantly working on myself as well the other thing is get comfortable with vulnerability um, and communicate those challenges to your people leaders and your peers, because you know what, a lot of the times people don't notice and it's okay. It's not that we can expect them to notice, but if we're not going to educate them, then we can't have that expectation from them either. So it's important. And I'm not saying that you constantly go and whine to people leaders and peers, but I think it's important to share your experiences because that raises an overall awareness, just like I'm doing here today. Establish boundaries. So if you're working for an employer that is not okay with your boundaries, that employer is, they're not worth your time because having a young family is not going to happen forever. Um, your priorities will constantly change and it'll obviously come to a point where you no longer have certain boundaries or you don't, you know, you're able to give more to your career, whatever the case may be, shift your focus. But I think overall, just for your mental, physical, and emotional well-being, boundaries are always very important in all aspects of life. Fellow colleagues, be comfortable with vulnerability as well. Um, I think this goes both ways. Uh, I think we don't share our emotions, our stresses, our stories as much. And again, I feel they go such a long way. Um, it goes beyond the competence and the knowledge that we truly have, um, and it can really be insightful and it can be beneficial and, and truly understanding people, their behaviors and, 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 you know, what they can accomplish and what they can't. Be conscious of uncomfortable situations for female colleagues. So this is going back to my example that I was using on the previous slide is the acknowledgement, it went a long way on its own, but being conscious of someone doing that subtle discrimination again of, you know, where are your kids uh, or who's with your kids while you're here or um, something as simple as, um, you know, the use of guys all the time. So like, hey, guys, and you have other people in the room or, you know, you guys were telling me this, for instance. So start becoming a little bit more conscious of those uncomfortable situations and those the, the subtle discrimination there. Request feedback, and this is not just, I mean, beyond performance review, maybe setting up a survey monkey with anonymous to be able to just be more aware of inclusive and something more along the lines of inclusivity. What, how is it that it can be a, a more uh, comfortable environment for everyone? Um, also, parental leads should not be career limiting. So that is something that I think is so important to instill in all aspects for female engineers, but I think generally this is a universal message as well. For everyone, direct and indirect people leadership. So this is your direct reports as well as people that maybe in your group, your mentees, folks that look up to you, support those females. Um, so not only the ones that directly report to you, but even in the workplace, if, if they have someone they can confide in, even if it's outside of their group, it goes a long way in helping support them through these challenges. Allow colleagues to enter into your homes. And now I'm not talking about come over for dinner and, you know, or play dates. And I mean, if you're as close to your colleagues like that, that is absolutely amazing. I mean, more so similar to what we did in COVID, 
um, even now I have scenarios where my kids will come in on camera um, while I'm in a meeting, while we're in a serious discussion. Yesterday, my child was screaming bananas on the top of his lungs while I was having a management team meeting and they heard every minute of it. It goes a long way and it's in no way demeaning or career limiting. If anything, people gain more respect for you and become more comfortable with you as well. Prioritize empathy. So again, I feel that females have a better handle of this um, versus males. And I feel that if we consciously, all of us prioritize this, this trait, it can go a long way. The other thing too, I think is the biggest piece that why the future generations, why are we still seeing such low percentages is because engineering is culturally and socially for a lot of people, not the ideal career for a woman. I feel that with our children, we always limit, or we start to limit, again, subconsciously in a lot of cases of what you can do and what you can't do. Girls play with dolls, boys play with Legos. Um, a girl can't do this because eventually she's gonna have children and who's gonna take care of those children. And this is not to say in any means that every household has this, but it's important for us to break that cycle. It's important for us to give that the, the open creativity and open opportunity to all children so that they can map out their future generations. I think that if my parents wouldn't have been as open-minded as they were, I would not have pursued civil engineering or I would have not even thought that STEM would be an option for me. Um, so I think setting up that foundation goes a long way for your children and also for the future generations. So it's a lot to cover in 45 minutes or 40 minutes, but um, that's all I had for you guys. So I really appreciate the time to be able to speak through my experiences. Thank you, Alok. Really appreciate your pers perspectives on that. It's quite interesting to see just how different um, construction and like traditional, when people think of an engineer, they usually think of like, something civil engineering and you're you're building a building or something like that they kind of forget all of us who also do engineering in other um in other places um and i really like that you're highlighting not just from the uh women in engineering aspect but also the we all need to shift for young families because i actually had but i have enough platinum highlights that my first child was in 2002. It was maternity leave, and that was federal. Didn't even enter anyone's brain that maybe the guy can, let alone should. And at that point, it was still help instead of be a partner. So yeah. I just used my vacation for the entire year for the first little part so that I could be part of that as well, which is a wonderful time. Anyone has brand, do not miss that. Yeah. Um, like take the time. Um, but for the second child, which was 2005, which is not that long ago, um, I just assumed it was the same thing. My boss didn't tell me any of different. There was uh, a younger tech at the time um, who knew his rights kind of thing. And he said to my boss, oh yeah, so I'm gonna take blah, like six months. But And my boss went, what? No, you're not. That's not allowed. So he actually had yeah. to tell him about the rules. Meanwhile, this is just like a month or two after I just burned my entire year's vacation. Yeah. And a little while later, one of the kids was like sick. And at that point, my wife was actually traveling quite a bit for her job. Um, so I said, yeah, so one of my sons, he has an appointment for blah, blah, blah. I actually got back. Well, can't your wife take him? So I actually had yeah. to convince him that um, last time I checked, I've 250 50 for parents we yeah. they're both our child I'm like what the heck yeah so i remember once systemically I even, is what i'm yeah. saying oh my goodness yeah. so i mean you guys obviously you you folks and actually i usually say folks i i hardly ever say guys anymore for the for the point that you actually underscored so i'm glad yeah. you actually pointed that out but it's interesting that it's a systemic shift that needs to happen so even those of us who really want to move we're actually pushing, know that we're actually pushing as well and getting pushed back. So 
it's just it's kind of sad but maybe to, if we all kind of band together and help that we can maybe move the needle yeah for <laughs> sure and i think that's where the support system kicks in michael right if you yeah, can yeah. support other female engineers and reinforce and make it a more comfortable environment i think it'll naturally happen as well yeah, yeah. For sure. absolutely absolutely yeah we're all we're all we're work families is the way i, I like to look at it um, yeah for sure okay so that's enough for me we have uh, some great questions here um, so we have two, I'm actually going to split them up. So it's not just two from the same person right in a row. <laughs> so first question from Frazin Rizva. She says, great presentation. Thank you. Um, how can women in leadership roles bring a deeper cultural change at the management level? And for instance, what do these changes need to be? So ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, I think that there's def different ways of doing it. There's, um, I mean, I think you can do training sessions. There's a lot of outside sources that are great as well to be able to train. Um, having kind of team building as well um, when it comes to having certain activities um, that are related to um, enforcement of, you know, different genders, um, uh, supporting females as well. But I think also just having that kind of conversation or being able to, you um, and again, I feel that there's a lot of training that takes place, but where you see a lot of the issues are on your day to day. And it's it's the subconscious again kicking in. Right. So even if you train someone, yes, you give them tips and tricks that they can can follow and adopt. But it's not necessarily that they will truly you know, immerse themselves into adopting them. But if, if you confront someone, I think that on its own goes a long way Um as well. So I think between training and getting external folks to be able to come in and, and truly work with your teams to, to work through some of these issues. And then also those day-to-day -day reminders as you, as you identify people going through those issues, I think they'll be helpful. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I, you cut, you alluded to it several times through your talk. Um, the, the, the kind of the way that I like to look at it, it's like, let's shift the needle and create a new normal. So it is actually not normal for you to ask yeah. those questions or act yeah. in that way. Thank you very much. <laughs> so exactly, uh, exactly. Um, we have a few from my colleague in New Brunswick, uh, Natalie, Natalie Baudreau. Um, so she again says, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, you mentioned that your maternity leave elevated your professional skills. Uh, can you elaborate on that? So, so for instance, she's actually just back and she has the cutest yeah. baby. Um, we, saw her, we saw her at last year's conference. It's, she's yeah. absolutely sweet. Um, Edible. <laughs> so, so she says, <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, she says, for me, I had to learn to trust my team and to delegate effectively. So she's curious how it was for you. So these are going to sound like really funny traits, but um, uh, time management was a key one. Um, being able to work on multiple tasks at the same time was one. My focus also on the task at hand became a lot more, um, uh, a lot stronger so that, you know, if I need to hash out a project or an assignment within one hour, boom, 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 boom it's going to get done over a day. Um, so I feel like my, my skills on focusing uh, definitely improved as well. Um, the time management piece as well. And my ability to function on minimal sleep, which goes a long way as well. You know, your kid's been up all day or all night rather, and you've got a big meeting the next day. And just being able to still have that same performance level, um, I don't think I would be able to, I, w I would have had the same previously. Yes, it's, it, it's, uh, it's interesting how as young parents, you learn that sleep is overrated. <laughs> it is. It's, it's very overrated. I think I feel more but tired. When caffeine I get only goes so far, <laughs> even if you have yeah. a, a small swimming pool for a mug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's actually it's a really true. good point because, I mean, everyone has looked at many, many different studies, but the accumulated sleep deficit does actually have a pretty, it's not straight line, but there's a definite correlation to accumulated drop in your potential IQ, which mm -hmm. actually takes several days to recover, um, several days of, of good replenishment uh, of your sleep. Um, so we have another question and we'll go back to Natalie because she has a second question. So okay. again, this is uh, again from uh, Farzine. Uh, so she says, very interesting point on the diversity piece. What do you think is the best way to recognize diversity 
um, and maybe integrate values and strengths from them rather than just, I, I cringe at reading this and clearly I'm a white guy. Um, it, it's rather than meeting a diversity quota, which is just awful that that was even our very recent past. And I hope most, if not all of us are moved on from that. <laughs> yeah. Would you mind repeating that question again, actually, Michael? Yeah, it's actually a really rich question. Eh? Yeah. So, so she says, um, so she's talking about the diversity piece. So she's mm -hmm. asking, um, what do you think is the best way to recognize diversity and really integrate those values and strengths rather than just meeting a, a quota, like a diversity quota? Yeah. So to be honest, I mean, diversity is a very complex. I think there's a lot of layers to it. Um, I think spiritually is, is a way to go about it is to start, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not just a matter of happy holidays, uh, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy Easter. Um, there's a lot of different cultures. Uh, Canada is a rich country um, and we need to be able to celebrate all the different holidays and all of the, the religious um, events that take place in people's lives, because for a lot of us, it's it's a big thing. Um, so I think acknowledgement of a lot of those, um, I know of companies that have introduced um, kind of flex days, if you'd call it, so that if you want to take it as a religious holiday type of a thing, they'll give you three days a year, for instance, and, and you can use it as you as you wish. Um, with the diversity, though, at least from my perspective, it also goes um, into the gender piece as well, right? Um, there's uh, obviously there's panels like this that are important. Um, again, there's uh, different events that as a company as well that we should be recognizing. Um, so it's not as it's not as simple as just making a post on LinkedIn to say, you know, happy International Women's Day. Our company is so proud. Um, but rather even having specialized events for that and to truly recognize it um, for the women. And I'm not sharing I'm not saying to, to gift them next something necessarily, but perhaps <laughs> something educational. On the educational side, again, just to kind of go back to that team building aspect of things where you can truly raise awareness on some of these issues. Love that. Love that. Yeah. I wonder how it is because, I mean, most of us are working on, on this, uh, signed into this webinar. Um, we work in hospitals, which I suspect we're a little bit further ahead than, say, construction or other industries for definitely yeah life balance kind of yep. um, flexible hours kind of thing. So, which... That's wonderful. I, I'm very thankful. <laughs> Hopefully everyone yeah. catches up. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Here's that we're, we get five minutes left. So let's try and slide in a, another couple of questions. Um, Natalie has a, actually a really good one. So you mentioned that you have a, a back pocket, kind of a, a shared response. Some of us would say it's like an elevator pitch or like a really, a really good zinger kind of response. Um, so you mentioned you have a back pocket response all prepared for unconscious or maybe non-obvious gender discrimination. So she's wondering if you can share that tip with her and everyone else. Oh boy, it depends on the situation to be honest, Michael. But from my perspective, a lot of the things that I have worked is, um, you know, it, it honestly, like it's, for instance, it's just, you know, who's with the kids at this point and me kind of looking aghast and being like, who's with yours? Even though it's, you know, it's a male, we all know who's with his. Um, and it's, it's similar things like that. Um, I don't, I, I, you can't have a universal statement because there's so many situations that come up where, you know, you have to just react and you have to be, um, you have to be um, able to manage it. But I would say that from my perspective, it's uh, I try to keep keep it comedic, but to the point as best as I can um, so that it gets the message across, but it doesn't necessarily make the person very uncomfortable. Yeah, cool, cool. I wonder what your husband gets. And it kind of ties into this next one, uh, which is from Stephanie Little. Um, so she gets thanks. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, and she says, uh, I'd like to echo what you and Michael have mentioned. Discrimination is often seen by males who share parenting responsibilities. As a mm -hmm. society, we need to be supporting these males to support the females in their lives. I like to look at it as everyone needs to give their head a shake. Your two parents, they're your plural kids. Like, why should it be a weird exception? And anyway, so I, I'd be curious um, what weird comments that your husband gets it's like well where are the kids <laughs> doubt that but anyway I, I, it's when, kind of it's sadly it, ironic eh? <laughs> yeah it is he does he absolutely gets no comments if he's away from the kids for too long 
But the interesting thing is the comments that he does kid get is, oh, you're with the kids again? Okay, are you okay? Do you need help? Can we drop off some food for you? Oh my goodness, like it's just such a huge undertaking for you. You know, how do you manage it? How do you tackle it? And for me, it's kind of like, there is. What do you mean how he tackles it? I mean, exactly. like, right? Whereas, again, it, it comes back to this is outside the work platform, but it's, it's uh, you know, even on a cultural or personal level, it's again, it's put on the, the onus is put on the woman to say, yeah, she can handle it all. But when it comes to the male counterpart or the other partner, it's just so much more elaborated and so much um, it's taken up to another complexity. And you're like, where, why didn't anyone ask me if I needed the support, right? Um, but for him, whereas he'll, it's funny because he himself will be like, uh, yeah, they're my kids. Of course, like I'm going to be able to take care of them. Why wouldn't I be? Um, so similar to the way that I try to be witty about things, he tries to do the same on his side too. So good for I, I just have to comment. I just have to <laughs> comment. Uh, yes. Uh, the young dad. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. The, um, the common term is, uh, it's like if the husband's watching the kids, uh, he's babysitting them. And it's like, yeah. but but you're exactly. you're also <laughs> the parent, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. That term very common when the husband's uh, right watching them. So I had to just comment on that. Yeah, no, that's de that's <laughs> definitely one that's a peeve for the both of us too. It's like babysitting. Yeah. I mean, nope, definitely not. But uh, yeah. Oh well, oh well. Um, <clears throat> we have one minute left. Let's see what we can do in one minute. Um, so thank you for your presentation. This is from. Um, Dominic Faldron, um, touched on a lot of similar points that I've experienced even in my background, uh, though it's a little different, so clinical engineering. We still encounter these types of events. Uh, I'd love that you've given tips to colleagues on how they can help females and male dominated, dominated fields. And tell you what, that pretty much brings us to the hour. A lovely reinforcement with, I, I think that's a very good sentiment, what um, Adil and I would echo back to, to you for sharing with us today, Ella. Um, really appreciate your time and your pers perspectives today. It's really good that, because we're realistically, I, I like to think of it as we're all a family, very diverse family, all with mm -hmm. equal chairs around the table. It's like, yeah. why should there be you and you? It's really you, it's like us, plural. We're all in this yeah, together. Sure. Let's let's all move the needle. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, and it'll get there if we break that cycle for the future generations and teach our sons and daughters and every all other children what it is, what it means to have everyone allowing everyone to have a seat at the table. And I think we can really get there. Actually, absolutely. And you know what? There's one thing we didn't mention today. Um, uh, there's a reason why we want so many different diverse people around the table. You have the same people around the table. You get the same answers to the same problem yeah. questions. We want newer, better answers. So exactly. You need, it's not just we want, we need more diverse people around the table. Right. No, like we, we can't, anyone who doesn't remember that or has lost sight of that, that's the real give your head a shake. Yeah, the diversity is what's going to lead to innovation and, and better. Uh, here, here better results but yes no thank you very much for having me again it was a pleasure and um we'll be in uh, touch one way or another lovely that's what, yeah because we still have a couple of questions if you don't mind uh we'll we'll kind of package those up and send them off to you um if for that's sure. okay and then when yeah. we get those responses we'll send them out to the entire uh group who registered so thank Sounds you very good. much today and um adil do you want to do some closing words to plug our like our next webinar yeah. So again, thank you all. Fantastic. Uh, just saying the same praises as everyone else is doing. Um, so we have our next webinar next week uh, on tu on Tuesday as we continue and end our women in engineering session. So please do join in uh, at that time. A and for now, uh, we'll see you guys next week. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.